Talk and Power, your motorsport and motoring radio show. Now on 88.5 FM, the valley comes alive. And podcasting across iTunes and talkandpower.com.au. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Talk and Power podcast, episode 89. And I am joined by Todd Brinkworth. Todd, thanks for coming along. No worries, Nick. Thanks for having us. So, unfortunately, no Simon tonight, but we do have a special guest, Street Machine Journal and Street Machine Hot Rod Editor, Boris Viskovich. So, it's really great to have him on board. He'll be on shortly. He's, um, he's going to be joining us and we're going to be going through all things. I mean, he's a local boy from the northern suburbs, grew up around here. So, um, yeah, we're going to be chatting a whole lot of things um, with Boris, and I'm really looking forward to that. We caught up at Motivation ooh, well, motivation this year in January, and we had a great, great old chat, and we said, you should come on and tell us everything you know. Well, Share your wisdom. Yeah, so, awesome. yeah. So. Anyway, so we'll have him on very soon. Hey, Todd, we need to get through a few formalities. The prize pool, the giveaway. So go to our website. Go to our website. Yeah. Go to our website. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. To You get an email from us. So we've got now the, well, we, you've seen that already? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Your voucher there. Yep. Yeah. The selector torch. But the prize pool is growing. It is growing. Oh, yeah. Shouldn't move my head away from the microphone. It's not very good podcasting, is it? <laughs> no. The shirt, as you know. Yep. Talking power shirt. Which someone I might have a fight to the death over, but hey, you know. You may do. Yep. Yeah. I think someone might win, you know. Jeez, I'm really butterfingers at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Stress ball for those that are stressed. Mobile stress ball. Thanks to I mobile. I think you need that one, but anyway. No, no I'm all good. I'm all good. Where has the? This is shocking. I'm terrible. Anyway, a couple of stubby holders, XYGT. Yep. Yeah, check this out. Check this out. Look at that. Oh. Vintage collection. Some more tumblers. Now these tumblers. These are Ford again. So there's a Mustang, XYGT, Cobra, all there. So. More tumblers. This is great. Yep. You know, I mean, someone is going to take all of this home. You take everything. You don't. You don't just win one part of it. You win everything. So subscribe. This is really <laughs> organised in this. Live and dangerous. Sure. Look at that. Oh, check that out. Ford cooler bag. That's pretty cool. What would that be? About five liters, six liters, seven maybe? Yeah. I'm going to put that over here. Now, if you've been watching, you're probably thinking, or listening, you're thinking, oh, this guy's giving away all Ford stuff because, you, you know, Ford, yeah. Ford man. Not true. Stop right there. For our Holden fans, check this out. This is, this actually got me a bit excited, Todd. You can win all this. You can win all of this. Can we see that? Can you see yeah, that? Yeah, we can. Oh, wow. I can't see the screen anymore, but anyway. Yeah. Check that out. Is It is a metal sign. We were just talking about some of those models off there too, Nick. In we between, were. Uh, yeah. Now, check this out. It goes from the FX, the first Holden. Yeah. Right Right up to the VK 1984, which, which I yeah. had, actually, one of those. So, check that out. It's not just all Ford paraphernalia. There is holding stuff here as well. And this is, this is like, I mean, look, look at, you know, I've got a big head. Yeah. But look how big that <laughs> sign is. It's much bigger than my head. Yeah. So you can win all of that. You need to subscribe to our website. So subscribe, yep. subscribe, subscribe. Head there. I'm sounding like just a repeating idiot now, but anyway. And there's two yeah. stubby holders. I don't know where the other one's gone. It's fallen. I don't think it's important right now to show you both stubby holders. They're exactly the same, but you will win both stubby holders anyway. So that's, that's the prize pool. So, and it had, look, I mean, I must thank everyone for, for um, subscribing, getting on there, putting your email address in. We won't bombard you. I promise. I promise we won't bombard you. Yeah. 
Now, and I need to thank All Fast Race Cars for their donation, Sylvan Australia for their donation in that lot as well. So, and the Talk and Power podcast for their donation in that. So, thank you very much to all those parties. Now, we need to shout out to another shout out here to the Pod Filter podcast. Yep. Both. Geez, what you almost rolled your eyes then, like you were just. No, I said yep. <laughs> you were annoyed uh-huh. with the outcome. We, we oh, participated. Yep, really. We participated in a quiz again with the the gents from the Pod Filter podcast uh, last week. That's not out yet, so we're not going to disclose the um, the outcome. But like, given Todd's reaction, probably we didn't win. No, no, anyway, I was I was I was happy. I'm happy to promote Adam and uh, yeah, the no. other guys. Adam we had, and we Dan, had a great night. We did. We had an excellent we had night. A ball. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have. As a, as a result of that evening, we have actually Italianized Todd. So yeah. right now, if you're looking at the screen, you'll see what I mean by that. But we've managed to Italianize Todd. But also, not only that, we should shout out to Adam and Dan. So Adam and Dan are brothers. They are now, Dan has replaced Simon at the, the Pod Filter podcast. So they're putting out great shows at the moment. Uh, and also, we met uh, Maddie J and Adrian from Car Talk with Maddie J. So it was a real, th- those guys are really great guys, actually. And they're based in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, and they run a podcast out of there called Car Talk with Maddie J. Tune in to those guys. They have a spot on local radio as well. So, and what they got, what those guys are doing is great. I, I really enjoyed uh, that evening. So, yeah, it was, it was great to, to be part of that. And, um, no, I really had a good time. The other shout out I want to do. I don't want to do too many shout outs, but this well, one's. Well, we should really... actually just before we. I'm going to put you Sorry. on the spot here. Hmm. A quick thanks to your well, your parents. I'm just going to say that we had it in the shed. Yep. And yeah, look, you have to watch the video um, of the of the night, <laughs> but I think we had a pretty good setup. Like I, I don't complain. You know what I mean? Like I'm quite happy. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to release a video. We we set up quite oh. elaborately. We we didn't want to do it here in, in our way. Yeah. Our make do a COVID nineteen studio. We wanted to do it somewhere special. So yeah, we went to mum and dad's house in one <laughs> suburb over. And um, yeah, look, I mean, the timing was really good. We'd only just made sausages that week, so it was. Re- I had a I had a ball actually. I think my I dad happy. had a good. <laughs> I think my dad had a good time as well. So yeah, um, no, it was it was great. Now, just one other shout out I want to do right now while we're opening the podcast. Andy Kale, great friend of the podcast. She's our graphic designer. So that that there, this was that was actually designed by Andy herself. And all the talk and power like this logo here, that was all designed by Andy. She's very, very creative young lady. And um, she's actually written a book called Don't Wait for the Green Light. Now, it tells of her journey through breast cancer. She's a breast cancer survivor and she put drag racing on hold and um, to fight, to fight cancer, breast cancer. And this is a book that you can get from her website. It's therapy on wheels. There's a link on the bottom. I shared it today as well on our Facebook page. So I head on over there, get a copy of the book. I'm going to buy one once we finish up here tonight as well. Very important you get a copy of that book. We are going to have Andy on, but she doesn't want to come on until her new car is finished. So our co-host is actually building a new car for her as we speak. Well, Andy and her husband, Mick and Simon, collectively the three of them are building a car. I'm not going to disclose what sort of car it is. It'll be a drag car, of course. I'm not going to disclose what sort of car it is or the engine combo but it's going to blow your hair back no matter who you are. And this car will be built to take passengers down the track. So we can't wait for it. And, but Andy won't come on until that car is ready to roll, which is fair enough. But I think we just, we don't want to just talk about the car. It'll be more about Andy's journey as well. It's very important that we, that we discuss that. So I want to, we will, that's watch this space. That's coming up. So while you're on that shout out in particular, Mm. A shout out to Mick and one of his co-workers, uh, Gareth. Yep. Who helped me out with some wheels for the Evo. There you go. Well, if he's yeah. a friend of Mick, he must be a good bloke. Yeah, no. Nah, so um, Gareth and I, a few weeks ago, ended up having a three-hour conversation, I think, in his carport. So, And I know he started listening with Mick at work. So, yeah, thank you. 
as I said, if they're friends of Andy and Mick, they, they have to be very, very good people. So yeah. anyway, I'm puffed out. We've got to catch up with Boris. Let's yep. get on to that right now. We'll take a short break here and we'll be back right after this, uh, this, this break with Boris Viskovich. Okay, welcome back. It's Talking Power Podcast episode 89, and we are here. We've, we have a special guest with us tonight, all the way from Street Machine Magazine, Boris Viskovich. Boris, thanks for joining us tonight. You're welcome, mate. Thanks for the uh, invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. We caught up at, at Motivation uh, earlier in the year, and, and uh, you know, we got chatting, and, uh, you know, I, I thought it was a I think it's great to have you on. You've been in the industry for a long time, uh, <laughs> prominent in, in Western Australia in, in the scene. So we thought, you know, great, it'd be great to have you on. Boris, tell us a little bit. I mean, you're actually probably one of the best exports out of Belcatta, I would say. <laughs> so t- tell us a bit, like you've done, you've done the suburb proud, you know, uh, but tell us a bit early life in the suburb. What was it like growing up in, in particular well, in Belcatta, the home of street racing and burnouts? Well, well, I'm, I'm born and bred in Osborne Park for a start, but I went to Belcatta Senior High School. Oh, okay. So, so, but, you know, I, I spent most of my childhood at uh, the Yugoslav Club on Jones Street. So I was in between... You know, Aussie Park and Belcatta yeah, a lot um, growing up. But, um, yeah, just uh, it, it was great. And it, and it was at the time a bit of a hotbed, I think, just that uh, a, a lot of, um, you know, ethnic majorities around the area. So everyone, you know, there was lots of Italians and Macedonians and Greeks and Yugoslavs. And, and uh, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, in, from my childhood, I remember going to discos at the Yugoslav club and I was, you know, nine or 10 years old and there were guys like Frank DiBagilio with his, you know, Bermuda green, uh, what is a Bermuda or Bahama green, whatever that Tirana color is that bright yeah. green, um, you know, panel vans with Statesman grills and all that, you know, in the, in the mid seventies, you know, I'm 53 this year. So I kind of remember that disco era and the, and, and that van scene as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's funny. I am, I'm on a, a Facebook page called the Balcata buzz and they, they talk about Delaunay street being, you know, should the speed limit should be lifted to 60 kilometers an hour. So back in the eighties, they were, they were doing, they were getting to one, <laughs> one sixty down that street. And we were like, if you were at the Yugoslav club, I was down at the Vasto club, which was yeah. basically the end of Delaunay street street back in those days and yep. you know how times have changed but you know i, I think we've yep. we've all moved on from from that time uh, I, I got woken up many times at about 2 a.m from the guthrie street drags you know because we lived uh, on the other side of the freeway so yep <laughs> yeah there, there you go there you go and a shout out to all of Aussie park listeners as well boris tell us a little bit you got started in 86 from memory you you got the the rambler tell yep. us a little bit about about your rambler because that's a car we don't have many guys on the podcast that have had their original car yeah from yep. all that way back then yeah so that's that's officially my second car i did have a, a tc cortina which met a uh a, a slightly uh, kind of had an argument with some roadworks so i was 19 years old and i uh, didn't have a car and my grandfather uh who had bought the car new he was 83 years old and they wouldn't give him his license back. And so he said, Oh, look, the Rambler's just sitting there. Uh, if you want to use it, you know, you know, you can borrow it. So I borrowed it, you know, yeah, in 1986 and I never gave it back. But um, uh, it's, you know, it was all, all original, but, you know, having an 80 year old driving it around had a few dings in it where he'd reversed into things and, you know, had a few you know, scrapes here and there. So um, it was, it was pretty good, pretty original, it had 79,000 miles on it. So I basically went to the, you know, Tom's uh, up on Main Street, Aussie Park for shopping and down to the Yugoslav Club for, for lawn bowls. And that was about it. You know, never really did uh, too much driving around. Yeah. But, uh, I drove it all through uni as a, you know, stock six cylinder, you know, um, just chewing through the juice, probably getting 16, 18 miles per gallon, you know. Um, and But back then you put five bucks fuel in and you know, mm. get, you get, keep you going for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, definitely. And it's a car that's, I mean, like we see the car, we associate you to that car these days. I, I, even, even other ramblers, I, I think of you because I think yeah. you, you've kind of uh, cornered that. <laughs> that yeah, I do. If someone sees a rambler for sale, invariably I'll get, you know, six messages <laughs> saying, oh, it's for sale. I'm like, like, one's enough, you know. 
and and that's the thing. Like, like like I said, I've had the car for a long time, and it's obviously it's evolved over the years. You know, it's um, the mm. colours changed. It's had three engines, two transmissions, a couple of dips. You know, but it's still my my ditter's old car. You know, so yeah, it's still sort of original. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful, beautiful car. Look, Boris, tell us. So we we're now in the late nineties here. You get stuck into websites now. Even I got stuck into the websites, but I probably didn't start till 01 myself. But okay, yeah. back in 1999, you, you, you sink your teeth into, into websites. Um, yeah. I reckon back in those days, a lot of car guys probably sunk their teeth into the early days of HTML and coding. Can you tell us what, what that was like back then? <laughs> so I worked, um, my background is in IT. I've got a degree in computer science and I, I worked for an IT you know, network support company. So I was obviously... Um, you know, knowledgeable enough to be be dangerous. Like I knew how to um, set up a basic web page, and uh, and you know knew how computers worked and how to you know set up all that stuff. So I was a fairly early adopter of of websites and got um, you know and always had a, a camera with me. So and of course back then film camera, take a you know go to a car show, you'd be you know have a roll of thirty six film and you might take six photos, eight photos, you know, because <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, the film was expensive. It was expensive to uh, to uh, develop, and uh, so I kind of regret that a bit now because I look at all my photos. Go, oh, I was at the you know, all Ford day or the GM owners day, and I've only got a handful of photos. Now mm. you take four hundred photos and you never look at them. But um, yeah, so I'd scan those photos, and and back then it was all dial up, so they're all scanned really small, and I'd upload them to my website and the, the the difference. And so the website and it's still going. Mm. It's called therumbler.com, but it's T H E hyphen. R U M B L E R. That's the, the nickname for the Rambler. Obviously, the Rumbler. It's about the most common nickname for any Rambler with a bit of horsepower. But um, uh, I then always put a little caption next to it, and that's you know, like few people had websites, but they throw up a whole bunch of photos, and then they would um, you know just leave it at that. Whereas I'd always make quite often a smart ass remark about it, and so I got a bit of a reputation for kind of <laughs> saying it you know like it is, and, um, yeah. and you know not always. I, I was never too cruel, but you know some cars needed a. a some styling guides you know, so. yeah yeah so i mean that was obviously a great opportunity for you to to, to sink your teeth into shooting and and photography so mm -hmm. fr from there how did you get into you, you got your first gig basically at australian street rotting magazine can you tell us yeah. a bit about how that that came about so by then, so I got married in 2000 and we went on a nice long honeymoon to the US. I'm slightly digressing, but I'll get around, back around to the point. And so we came back um, after three months in the US and thought to ourselves, well, do we want to just stay in Perth just because we grew up in Perth? And then, you know, we decided to, um, to move to Sydney. And so that was obviously a big, um, big eye opener for me because I'd, you know, seen some cool stuff in Perth. But then, you know, a few months in the US, I, I saw more custom paint jobs and metal flake and flame jobs in one day in California than I saw in my entire life in Perth, you know? So going to Sydney, um, there was a lot more exposure to that as well. Yeah. There's a lot more cars, a lot more people. And I just went to just about every event that I could find. So from 2001 onwards, you know, the, 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 the Rumbler website was getting pretty, pretty popular and, you know, I was updating it fairly frequently. And, um, and then uh, I went along, uh, to the the rat rod day at Tarrant Point in Sydney, and that was I think the second one that I went to, second or third one that they'd actually run, and uh, put a bunch of photos up on my website, and then I got mm -hmm. a uh, probably an email from Larry O'Toole from Australian Street Riding, and he said, oh look, I've I've always wanted to go to that show, I can never make it because it clashes with something down in Victoria, and so he asked me if I could send him the photos and um and write a story, and I went, oh, I'll give it a crack, and and like I said, I you know used to do lots of captions for the um, uh, for, for my website so I, I can write a little bit about it and I, my spelling's always been pretty good not many car people can spell they can't even spell you know Chevrolet or Edelbrock or uh, Offenhauser um, for instance but um, even though it's written on their engine uh, but, but uh, sorry I'm being a prick um, but uh, and that was the start of it so I did a few jobs for Larry O'Toole and then uh, and I was still working in IT at the time and then um I kind of got really annoyed with my IT job and I decided to chuck it in one day without any forethought as to what I was going to do. And, um, and then my wife said to me, well, what are you going to do now? You're going to, you know, uh, do more with this magazine stuff. And I said, Oh, I guess so. And then, then she said to me, well, who, 
who do you want to work for? And I said, well, Street Machine is probably the biggest magazine. And mm. so I gave him a call. So I rang, I rang one day and, um, you know, got rang the reception and got put through a couple of people. And I ended up speaking directly to Jeff Seddon, the editor of Street Machine at the time. So this is 2000 and, um, 2004 or late 2003. And, um, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, how about you come in tomorrow? So I was a bit, I was expecting sometime in November or something to, to go in and have a meeting. And uh, yeah, so I quickly got some photos together and scanned a few of the stories that I've written for Larry. And, um, and thinking you know, to myself, I was a pretty good photographer at the time, you know, and, uh, and so I thought he'd be really impressed with some of my photos from these various car shows. And he flicked through that and I thought, oh, geez, you know, he's gone through those pretty quick. And now looking back, I realised most of those photos were shit. But um, uh, he then, he actually spent the time to read the stories. And so yeah. he, he was actually quite impressed with how I'd, I'd written about the stuff and was impressed that my apostrophes were in the right place and I knew how to use commas and, and mm. my spelling was good. So... So yeah, and his and his very sage words. He was, you know, I, I think I said, I oh, said, so you think I'll get a job? And he goes, look, I'll give you one job. It's entirely up to you whether you get another. And that was, like I said, two thousand and four. I did my first job for Street Machine, and I've been a regular contributor um, ever since then. You know? so yeah, fantastic. Yeah. It is that, and that is a fantastic achievement for for yourself. I, I think that's a going endorsement on 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 yourself because, let's be honest. I mean, Street Machine is. Australia's leading car magazine in terms of modified cars. Sorry, yeah. uh, there's no no doubt about it. And I think you know, there's a lot of people that have come and gone in the in the past, but you know, Street Machine's been around for a yeah. long time. And to, and to be so, not only you're just a journo there, but you're also the editor of Street Machine Hot Rod magazine yeah. as well. So, yeah. I guess in 2020, tell us what that's like being not only just a, a journo for the the um, Street Machine magazine, but also editor for their Hot Rod version as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, j- just to, you know, I'm, I'm sure people have probably figured this out, but, um, you know, uh, well, as you said, it's a, it's been around a long time. Street Machine has been around since 1981. It's got a very loyal following and a loyal readership. And, and so, we, you know, we've done well when a lot of other magazines have gone by the wayside. And I think a lot of that is to do with every single person that works on the magazine is, is like me. They're a genuine car guy. They were car guys before they were magazine guys you know mm. they they love their cars they've all got their own modified cars um and and they genuinely love the the passion you, you don't go into journalism to to make a fortune i'll give you the tip you know um, as mm. jeff said and said to me when uh, he told me about his previous life and he had a good job in industrial relations and uh, you know for for two his brewery or something and then he goes and then i threw my family into abject poverty by becoming a motorcycle journalist you know so i'm like do i really want to do this you know i probably could have got a job you know that paid uh, good money but anyway it's it's been really enjoyable um and going back to 2004 like you mentioned street machine hot rod i've actually been involved with street machine hot rod since the very first issue which was in 2002 and and that was part of the reason i think i came on board because of my uh um you know knowledge in in hot rodding and um they it it was used to be a bit annoying when you'd read a story about a hot rod you could obviously tell that the person that wrote the story didn't really understand some of the nuances with styling and and some of the terminology and things like that so um so they they got me on board for that one of my very first jobs with street machine hot rod was doing an a to z of um hot rod terminology so that was a great uh, great story and it got my a lot of my photos in the magazine as well because just pictures of you know various hot rods and eye beam axles and hairpins and radius rods mm. and that kind of stuff. So, so yeah. that was good. But um, uh, I guess, yeah, um, I, I have been the editor. I can't even remember. I think since about Hot Rod, we're up to issue 20 now. And I think I've been the editor since number 14 or, or something like that. Prior to that, it was Simon Telford. Mm. And he got the job, Jeff Seddon, uh, when the magazine moved to Melbourne. He um, didn't, didn't move down to Melbourne with his family. Obviously, that was too much of an ask. So Simon Telford became the editor of Street Machine. Yeah, and uh, and then he passed on uh, the, the strip machine hot rod uh, title to me, which was um, a very big honour. So yeah, yeah. What else did you want to know about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that leads me to my next question then, Boris. Like, I mean, what challenges for, for yourself? How do you stay relevant in a, in a, it's, a, it's a paper magazine? It's a hard yeah. copy magazine. How do you guys stay relevant in a yeah. a growing digital world? Yeah, well, th- that's the other thing. Um, so right from when I first got involved, Street Machine was uh, getting involved with the online market already. So we, we've had a website um, since 
you know, the early 2000s. And that was also part of my job because of my IT background, I could do website updates and stuff like that. So I would quite often go in for a, a week at a time because I've, I've always worked freelance, but I've spent a lot of time in the office working with the, the uh, crew on staff there. And so, you know, f yeah, from 2004, 2005, um, yeah, we, Jeff Seddon always explained it as a, it's not a replacement for the magazine. It's a, it's a addendum. It's a, it's an additional feature to the magazine. So that's what we try and do. Like you get the magazine, you'll have the, the feature story and now mm. we'll run a video alongside it or, you know, the web story might have a few extra photos because, you know, we, we have dozens and dozens of photos of the cars that we feature, but we can only yeah. fit, you know, six or eight or 10 photos in the magazine. You've only got four or five pages or, or something like that. So it's always been, to add more value to the to the magazine, not to replace it, and yep. and obviously that's been harder and harder. And I think with Street Machine, with its history, with the the prestige and the bragging rights that comes with being in the mag magazine, and then especially if your car makes the cover of Street Machine, it's still a, a very big deal. And and yeah, you might have your car featured on a website, but once someone's you know flick past it, kind of gone. It's know, forgotten about, it's always, isn't it? Uh, always in the magazine. There's, there's a number of cars over the years that have made the cover and I, I, this is going back a long time. I mean, back in the eighties, but I still have a distinctive memory of, yeah. and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but I've got the magazine here somewhere. XC yeah. Coupe with a, I think it was a 671 hanging out of the bonnet. And, um, you know, that car has stuck with me in my mind for a long time. And as I said, I know the magazine, I go to it often yeah. and I so see that. And with overkill on the plates and it's that's Barry the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look, <laughs> we, we can just, we can just, the same, I'm the same. that's one of those cars. If you look at, you know, like we just did the, um, you know, Street Machine Legends book. Have you seen that book? I have. Yeah. Hardcover book. And it's basically, we went through, you know, all the cars that were featured um, in the first 20 years. So from 1981 to 2000. And that was a you know no brainer to put that in the magazine, you know. Mm. And there are a number of cars, especially because I started reading the magazine in nineteen, you know, buying it for, as a teenager in nineteen eighty three, and so I've got all those magazines, you know, from the very early days, and a lot of those cars still stick in my mind. There was the uh, like a nineteen seventy or seventy one Camaro with a, a big block in it, the Lush Brothers built. That was just the fact that it was a Perth car and it was in Street Machine was was uh, memorable. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of those cars. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and, I was, and as I said, I think it's, you know, obviously the leading magazine in, in Australia and the cars that you, you, you hit the nail on the head. If you, your car makes the cover of Street Machine, you know you've, you've certainly made it. You've, yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's, and there have been a few, um, you know, I think that's the nice thing um, about going to Sydney and um, getting to know the Street Machine guys really well. When I came back to Perth, there's been a bunch of cars um, featured from Perth, you know, like not long after I got back, uh, uh, Cassie Rhodes uh, Charger was on the cover. Um, uh, Chris Dicker's Silver Monaro as well, blown HQ Monaro Coupe. Yeah, that was on the hmm. that was on the cover as well. Um, yeah, there's been been a bunch of cars since then featured yeah. in Perth, and that's that's always been a thing just for me to you know, help promote the West Aussie scene and, and get a few of the cars in the magazine. And that's what we were always trying to do. And in the past, there just wasn't, you know boots on the ground here to, to kind of mm. make it happen so yeah it's been yeah great. yeah no definitely well speaking of street machine staff what one of the guys that i admire dearly is is scotty and yes. i love his carnage product the the the, yep. the, the brand carnage in my from the from my view, from my point of view, uh, a lot of money and resources probably goes into, and a lot of time as well, into that, what I, what I call a free product. Yeah. Is this the start of Street Machine's commencement into a subscribed paid product like, like Roadkill? Or is this just, this will purely stay a, a, a free product? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on the, on the nitty gritty on that. You know, that's all run out of, out of Melbourne. Um, but I remember many years ago, Simon Telford saying, I just want to get Scotty in a little shed somewhere and get him to play with cars. And we're talking four or five years ago. And at the time, um, you know, that was when we were um, getting more involved in the you know, online scene and, and um, internet advertising was starting to actually mm. um, have a, a big effect on the, on the bottom line of the magazine. So at the very start, we did everything ourselves. We, you know, like edited the videos and did all that. 
And then after 12 months, kind of went back to the bean counter and said, look, we can make money doing this internet stuff. And then it, it's, it's grown from there. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's like Roadkill. I'm a big fan of that as well. And, and that was all on YouTube and it was free. And then it all just became a mm. you know big conglomerate. But I still pay my eight bucks a month or whatever it is. And I get you know, Motor Trend on demand. And I reckon it's some of the best you know, best stuff uh, you can watch. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, if you had asked me, if you ever had to give me a heads up, I could have probably um, asked. Oh, no, I love that. But, I mean, it's... Yeah. but there has been a change in ownership as well. Um, you know, like a uh, street machine was owned for a number of years. Uh, it was part of ACP, Kerry mm. Packer's um, company. And then it was bought out by Bauer Media, just, um, you know, whatever it was, six years ago or something. And, um, yep. and now it's changed hands again. So I don't know if that's going to affect any of, of that stuff. But, you know, they still do it on a pretty tight budget. They get sponsored with the tools and some of the products, obviously. You know, they um, Hair and Forbes and um, Ryobi, mm. very obviously. I don't know whether we can, you know, plug all those guys. But no, we they can seem say to really, want. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and all the um, Rust-Oleum as well then. Because, you know, yeah, they've done a great job on that Valiant station wagon. And that's, you know, and that's the thing, Scotty, I love Scotty. He's, he's been, um, he was the deputy editor um, when I, first started the magazine and he's just a knockabout, knockabout car bloke and mm. just loves his valiance but you know he's he's just like us uh, just loves playing with cars and just i think um yeah his dad was very heavily into cars as well so he's just learned um you know through just just doing it yeah, so yeah. Great. yeah and oh, I, I take my hat off to him and oh, and it's not just him there's a guy behind the camera as well and mm. no doubt there's probably a sound guy or a guy yeah. that there's you know having to set all that up and no doubt yeah. you know there's there's a team of probably three four guys there that that's their yeah. almost their full-time job so yeah, well i think scotty actually does a lot of that himself as well like he's behind yeah. the camera when when kian's filming and then when kian's doing something and then kian's behind the camera when scotty's doing something and yeah. i think scotty i don't know how he finds the time you know he's got a couple of you know, kids at home as well and Mm. um yeah he's he's uh you know pretty uh pretty busy but we do definitely have people um editing the videos and stuff in the office as well so yeah it all comes together really nice and and it's it's nice because it's not too flash you know it's, yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, just a couple of blokes in the in the in the garage and it's, it's good yeah. yeah yeah no no certainly agree with that i um i think there's some there's there's a certain feel to it that i certainly agree with there and it's um it's 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 tangible with your viewers as well. Well, we can yeah. all, especially the Rustoleum uh, segment as well. I mean, when he was pulling that Valiant apart, I could really identify with what he was going through at the time. Because yeah. um, I pull, if I was to pull my X Dub is not that bad, but I mean, yeah. I can see and the value in the product as well. That's the most yeah. important thing out of it. I felt that there was value in that product. So, yeah, yeah. hats off yeah. to him, Absolutely. Boris. Look, tell us. <laughs> Our industry, like in in your mind, how, how do we survive? How, how does our industry survive an emerging group of energy efficient youth that you know are getting around in ride share these days? And that's their firm belief it's not cool to burn, burn fuel. What, what what are your thoughts there on how our industry will it survive, and where do you see it in maybe ten years time? Yeah, well, you know, you probably remember when we were seventeen or eighteen, and we were going to run out of fuel in. 20 years or whatever. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm still driving a, you know, six litre V8 around every day. Um, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, I think probably a bit like in America where, um, you know, like SEMA is, is very big and, um, and they understand that it's a, it's a, a business. It's a, um, it's a livelihood for a lot of people and it's a, and it's a big industry, you know, so there's a mm. lot of people's livelihoods at stake. So, um, you know, I think, it, it needs to not be um, vilified as much as it, it is. I mean, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're an old guy driving an old car, no one gives you any grief, you know, but the, the younger crew coming through, I think they still, still cop it a bit, but um, yeah, I'd, I, I think in terms of gas guzzles and all that, I mean, I don't care what we got to um, use to, to fuel the engines or power the cars, you know, guys are doing electric conversions or whatever. Um, yeah, we'll find a way around it. We'll drive cool stuff regardless of, of what, you know, the, the powers that be decide the rules are. Mm. But I think it's also a bit of an individual expression. I know, you know, um, just driving around, I, I'm, I'm in my car almost every day. I'm dropping the kids to school. I'm going to shops. And I reckon I've noticed more recently, people are just very appreciative of the cars, chucking laps uh, um, through, I'm, I'm, well, no, I'm sounding like I'm 19 again. I wasn't chucking laps through Northbridge. I was heading into Northbridge with my wife on Saturday night. And, um, 
got, you know, one guy actually knocked on the window and came and said, oh, you know, it's beautiful and, you know, yeah, good on you and all that. And, you know, and a lot of young people appreciate the car. So yeah. there is that interest there and that passion there. And you just got to pull up to a set of lights and look at the five-year-old kid sitting in the back of the Prado. And he looks at, looks at you know, my car or any old car that comes up and they know, they inherently know that it's different to all the other cars and they're attracted to it and they're interested. Yeah. In it. Whether it's yeah. the bright colours or the, the noise or the smell of raw fuel coming out of the exhaust, I'm not sure. Um, mm. But... I think it, you know that, that people just need to, um, yeah, not become just part of the, you know, the boring masses. I guess yeah. I I can't stand driving around in a nondescript car, you know, and, mm. uh, and and the problem is everyone knows where I've been and where I'm going because they'll see me at the lights or oh you know I saw you why didn't you wave I'm like what were you in a white Land Cruiser I mean how am I how am I meant to see you you know um, you know <clears throat> excuse me um, so yeah I think maybe that's it's that individuality and the fact that um you know modifying cars you know I, i've always considered it a it's a it's a form of artistic expression as well you know like mm. how people do up their cars how they modify them the colors they paint them how they detail them it's it's you know not many car guys had considered themselves artistic you know by the traditional sense but um yeah you know i've always built you know plastic model cars and and stuff like that and and you try different things out and you just you, you know there, there is an artistic bent to doing that you know and um and in fabrication, even you know, the, you know, guys don't just make something that works. They'll quite often try and oh, I'll just make it look a bit nicer than it, you know, than it needs to be. And you know, that's all all part of it. So maybe that's an angle we got to yeah. Know, take. But, so, Boris, tell us then. Looking over the years, we've seen trends come and go, and and you would have seen seen it all. The the yeah. trends come and go. We're living in what I would call a turbo era now, or a bit of you know, turbos are, are the thing. But there's something still primal about the supercharger especially when it's when it's through the hood we just finished yeah, talking yeah. about overkill as well yeah. in your mind is that deemed the ultimate street car what what would what would how would you define that um yeah i'd love to have a blown hemi you know sticking out of something uh one day but i think uh, how i reckon the scene has has evolved over the years um you know when i was yeah, you know, first getting into it, you had um, you know, people were building like full-on show cars. You know, cars mm. that weren't really usable usable at all. Um, you know, when you look back at uh, oh, some of the stuff like um, oh, what was the the Dulux, the Motivator, or whatever that panel van, that crazy panel van that um, uh, geez, it was. I was just looking at the pictures the other day. You know the guy I'm talking about. Um, but you know, ca cars that were just built solely to win points at shows and yeah. and, uh, and stuff like that. And and yeah, and it's also probably because I was young and anything shiny under a car would have impressed me. I maybe look back mm. at those cars now and they, they weren't that good. And also, you know, quality has improved so much in the last 20, 30 years that what was considered a show car back then is now just a nicely detailed street car. Um, but you know, cars went from you know unusable you know blind big blocks or hemis that you know barely ran you know back in the 80s and 90s they might have made a couple of laps around summonats maybe and mm. even even still some of those cars you know because i've been to summonats for well, since summonats 18 i think was my first one i've been to pretty much everyone since as part of the street machine crew and i've seen you know the the cars in the top 60 evolve to the point where the most recent one the cars that were all going for grand champion were genuinely tough you know, well-running cars, well-sorted cars. Whereas, you know, even 10 years ago, some of the cars could barely get off the line. They do a go to while and they're coughing and spluttering and stalling or the battery's gone dead or whatever, you know, mm. cars just, just don't function. But, you know, for a long time, especially in the street machining scene, it was all about the burnout cars. You know, it was first, first off, it was just, you know, put a crazy motor in a car and, and, and do some skids. And then those, you know, those small blocks turned into big blocks and then those big blocks turned into methanol big blocks. And then all of a sudden you got 1500 horsepower in a car. And then, you know, to stand out, the next guy goes, well, I'm going to give it a nice paint job, you know? And then the next guy goes, well, I'm going to put a nice interior in it. So all of a sudden you've got these elite level cars. Yeah. Like Gary Myers has done it. Um, mm. Clint Ogilvie's done it. Uh, Steve Loder, you know, all those guys, they've got essentially elite level cars and they're, they're doing burnouts with them. Yeah. And now I reckon the burnout scene's kind of plateaued. They're still, you know, still popular and still a lot of tough cars there, but people aren't going as crazy um, with their cars. And now mm. it's all genuinely fast street cars. Like you look at what's happening with the radial racing now. And I think, yep. so the burnout, the burnout scene grew out of people that were bored with drag racing. And now, like even, I just saw Matt James is getting into drag racing, which is interesting. Um, yep. you know, with a Tirana, that'll be a, no doubt a serious car. Um, 
but people want genuinely quick and usable cars. And that's why all your you know, twin turbo or you know, turbo LS stuff and your Barra stuff, it all fits under the bonnet. You know, you got so many 10 second cars and then 987, you know, <laughs> second cars yeah. that you can literally still drive on the street because, you know, when they're not on boost, they're still a usable car. And, and that's, that's really clever. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing that um, they're able to do that, but that's all thanks to computers and EFI and, and really clever tuning. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, definitely. No, I appreciate that, that thought. But then like in America, you've still got uh, like Larry Larson or, you know, uh, the, the six seconds Camaro, you know, it's, it's a yeah. pro mod on the street. So it's all Tom, about Tom Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how much, how much can you put up with when you're driving on the street, you know? Mm, so um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know, but I think there'll always be something about um, having a lump of metal hanging out the bonnet. That's just super cool. Just, I, I wish the powers that be didn't make such a big deal about it. I mean, uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't know if, if, if some, if they're worried about the bits of metal sticking out of the bonnet of your car, you know, hurting a pedestrian, then, I think, you know, that's the least of their worries you know, if they're getting hit by something <laughs> like that. Uh, I certainly, yeah. yeah. Well, Boris, tell us, we were talking about WA there in particular. You're, you're heavily involved in the WA Hot Rod and Street Machine Spectacular. Unfortunately, yep. being cancelled for 2020 for, for reasons yep. beyond your control. Would have been, yep. A, yep. Would have been last... Just gone, week. yeah, a couple of yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, June 13 and 14 would have been. Yeah, yep. yep. So, but tell us, can you tell us a bit about your involvement yep. there? Because that, I mean, that is tip, that is probably the, prim, not probably, it is the premier static car show of Western yep. Australia. Yep. So I, I was... Um, making myself sound old again. Uh, I've been involved with that since the very first show as well. So the first first show was run in 1997. Um, and I think we had our first committee meeting for that in about 1995. I actually came on board because I was involved uh, in the in the plastic modeling side of thing. And, and you know, we were trying to bring back those kind of 60s car shows um, where, you know, like a lot of the hot rod shows had, you know, cars on display and then the, the model cars for the, for the kids and the kids that never grew up. And, and so I, I got on the committee to help him out with that. And then my wife was also a very good salesperson and a good marketing person. She helped organize all the trade shows. So, you know, we, all the trade stands. So we, um, we always wanted the show to be a bit of a one-stop shop for people to come along to mm. see the cars and then go, Oh, well, I'd, I'd love to build one of those, but I don't know where to start. So, you know, we wanted to get, you know, your chassis guys there, your, your engine guys there, your motor trimmer, your painters, whatever, and have all those trades ready you know to to take business from um mm. and uh and so for about 10 years or so there wasn't really a static car show in perth you know you had motivation and stuff like that yep. and the hot rodders kind of boycotted motivation a bit because hot rodders at the time they figured if you're going to enter a show then you know you should be paying us you know to put our cars you know, on display and, and that's kind of stems from a history back in the game dating back to the 60s where a car club would put on a show and then they'd you know run it for a week and then they'd basically divvy up all the profits to the members fair enough you mm. know but that's you can't do that in this day and age and um and uh, so now you know the the entrance pay their entry fee but it's only like 40 or 50 dollars anyway which yeah. you know, isn't even a tank of juice these days um but uh yeah, so getting back to my point, there wasn't a static car show. There was motivation, but mm. I remember going to motivation when I was at Burswood Dome. Oh, go and look at this car. Oh, hang on, where's the car? Oh, it's in line at the burnout competition. Yeah. You know? So so they had driving <laughs> events and stuff like that. So they were pulling cars out. And it still happens at motivation where you kind of have the elite mm. camp where they try and, you know, um, move you know, move the cars around or whatever. And I, I understand the struggles that they deal with because they want it to be a static. Uh, they want to have an elite level show, but they also want that, you know, dynamic uh, show uh, um, feature, you know, and that's that's yeah. fair enough. But I, I don't know how we've kind of talked about it. How you um how you balance that? So that's mm. why we you know we've never even had a dyno competition or any of that kind of stuff because you know it's just a lot easier to ensure a static event. And we also wanted people to really um, be able to display their cars and and you know lift them up and light them up and put mirrors under them and just really showcase. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the detail on the cars just to show people what it was like. And, and the hot rodders knew how to do that. And we were always trying to get some of that crossover to the street machine side. And, and so now it's been, you know, it'll be um, whatever, 20, 24 years or whatever next year. And that's happened, you know. I mean, the whole point of the committee um, running the show was to lift up the quality of the cars in Perth. 
Yeah. And when you consider ex boss, you know, came out mm. of Perth. Chris, I mean, yes. not saying we're you know we're we're directly involved, but we we gave um, you know the the local scene a, a platform to to showcase their cars because you know if you're going to build a car or that not have anywhere to take it or you've got to drag it across the country to do it then you know people aren't really going to go that effort but yeah um, i'd like to think that we had a, a little part to play in just you know lifting up the quality and just people just see you know they get ideas from from seeing other cars um, mm. you know, they, they might not take all the ideas on board but they'll just see how some part of the engine's detailed or the undercarriage is detailed and away they go but um you know like the like i said xbox still to me, the best street machine ever built in Australia. I was lucky enough to actually go to Detroit and go to the Detroit Autorama you know, with Chris and, and cover up the street machine. Uh, yeah. Jordan Least and Chris Thoroughgood as well for street machine went across and man, we had a ball and, and saw some amazing stuff. And, and, you know, and Chris had already been to SEMA a few times and he was confident that he was, he was up there. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. But then when I got there, yeah, that, um, that car was just as good as, you know, and, and better than, than yeah. you got everything there. You know, it was amazing. Yeah. We, we probably need to get Chris on at some point. I've, I've spoken with Chris in the, in Chris in the past, but we haven't, we haven't, um, we yeah. haven't had him on yet, but yeah, yeah. we, re, we certainly need to do that. I, well, tell I us highly a bit, recommend it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us a bit about that trip to, to, to Vegas while, while we're here. Well, that was Detroit. I've been to Vegas Detroit, as well for sorry. SEMA. Yeah, that yep. was good as well. Um, so that's the other thing. I mean, uh, yeah, people might think, oh, you know, you're flying around all over the place. I've been, you know, I've been to the UK and covered um, uh, the beach racing at Pendine Sands, but I was actually over there on my own dime for, for the university that I was at. Um, we, we raced a car at Silverstone, but on that same weekend was uh, um, the, the uh, hot rod races at uh, Pendine Sands. So I went to that. Uh, I've been to SEMA for Las Vegas. That was that was cool. SEMA actually um, uh, ponied up for that. That was awesome. And then um, yeah, for Detroit Auto Ram, it was great. I flew I flew across with Jordan Least, and um, and that's a entertaining uh, couple of couple of days. And um, you know, cool. we, we arrive in Detroit at like midnight and. What's Jordan want to do? Have mac and cheese at 1 a.m., you know, for, 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 for a midnight it snack. It is a so, shock. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, we you know, we rocked up in – and it's, so it's, it was – when is it, late January or early February? So there's, there was snow on the ground, you know. So mm. two boys from Perth. I mean, yeah, you know, I hardly ever see snow. And so we're driving along and there's, you know, foot deep in snow and there's snow in the car park. And, um, yeah, we, we get to the hotel and then we uh, go to where – Chris had a car at a workshop there and they were just doing some final detailing and um, you know, Greg Maskell was there and there was a whole bunch. There was about 30 people, 40 people that went across, you know, a lot, a lot of West Aussies and a, and a few from over East as well. And, um, you know, they, they were still getting the car ready. There was literally a couple of days to go because we got there on the, oh, I think on the Tuesday or the Wednesday or something and, and the mm. you know, car had to leave in a couple of days, but they'd been there a couple of weeks prior. And, um, you know, if you're familiar with Xbox, the bonnet and the boot are all a fiberglass because of the shapes that they had to put in it. Like the, the, the bonnet looks like a standard XB bonnet, but it's all completely modified. And, you know, it had been painted in, in uh, Shepparton where Greg Maskell is in 40 degree heat or whatever. And then they take it to sub-zero and, and the fiberglass has just moved around a bit. So, you know, Greg's like repainting the bonnet on the car, you know, just before wow. the show. And that's the kind of level they had to go to. But then it's all about cleanliness. Like the, the cars are all so good. You know, they actually judge everything on how clean the cars are. So Chris actually had, you know, Jordan and myself under the car. I had a stick with a cotton butt on the end and I'm wiping, got a bit of quick detail on it or something. I'm wiping around the grommet that goes from the airbag hose up into the chassis, you know, like we're into the floor, you know. So there's just a little rubber grommet. I'm just cleaning around that, you know, making sure there's no dust on anything or any little kind of, you know, greasy marks or anything like that. And, and so I've spent hours you know, underneath that car and, and, and really appreciate the amount of work that went into it as well as seeing it being built. But going to the Autorama itself, um, yeah, there's, it, it's, it's like our show, but, you know, three or four times bigger. There's 750 mm. cars on the floor. You know, we've got 200 uh, in, you know, the Hot Rod and Street Machine Spectacular. They've got 750 upstairs. And then there's another kind of uh, suede palace underground, um, like a little, show for hot rods and customs and stuff that's yeah. um, got another 150 or 200 cars, you know? Mm. So it's a struggle just to get around and see everything. Yeah. And of course we were there mainly to check out the Riddler award and, and, you know, and, you know, Chris made the grade eight. So he was one of the top eight cars. And I reckon in reality, he probably finished second or third. The car that won it that year was just an open checkbook build, you know, at a professional shop and it was amazing, but it was an ugly 
car. You know, it wasn't. A, yeah. It was. It was a hot rod, but it was just a. It was a coach built car, basically. You know. Yeah. Um, and you could argue that you know Xbox is probably just as just as much coach built. There's not much that hasn't been touched on that. But um, but there was still some amazing stuff to see. But then there was also stuff that was pretty run of the mill. You know, when you got 700 mm. cars, they're not all going to be you know gobsmacking, but there's still some pretty amazing yeah. stuff there. Yeah, no, that's 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 incredible. I I, I know Johnny, sponsor of the podcast as well, yeah, Benzine yeah, D'Italian. Yeah. I don't think he was able to get over for the uh, D- Detroit, but I know he's done a lot of work on Xbox yeah, as well. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I know when it's gone to Motor X, Johnny's gone over to to work yeah. on it as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, amazing car. If you haven't seen it, um, I will be posting some pictures of it online. As if you're watching the video, they're on the screen right now. So, yeah, check that. That is amazing car. We'll, we'll endeavour yep. to get Chris on. Yep. Well, well, speaking of car shows, Boris. I mean, yep. when we caught up, who was that motivation? What, what, in your mind, where do we need to go with the? Ne- what's the next step for any car show in, in Western Australia? In your mind, how do we get? We felt that the numbers. I think any everyone would agree the numbers weren't great at motivation. No. How do how do we bolster that show or or any car show? I, I think people just need to support it. I mean, you know, Perth's probably exceptionally bad. Um, Australians are a bit like that in general, where they'll whinge and moan about something, but then they won't go to it. Then they'll complain that no one goes to it. So I think you just need to get behind as much as you can, but. I think a lot of those events are also a big commitment. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not sure, not, not so much even financially, but just time, you know? So you, you look at cars and coffee, for instance, you know, you get six, 700 cars roll up, but the yeah. reason is, you know, it costs you next to nothing and you can come and go as you please. You know, it's like two hours out of your morning. Mm. And, um, you know, whereas you, you know, when I started, when I first got involved with um, cars, I, I was involved with a club called American Streeters. So it was just a mix of, all sorts of, you know, American, any American, um, you know, hot rod or, or classic car. And, you know, you'd go to a, a park at nine o'clock in the morning and you stayed there till three or four o'clock in the afternoon. You basically had a mini show and shine for the whole day. Mm. Um, and, you know, you basically rode off the whole day to do it. Whereas people just, I don't know, either don't have the patience or don't have the time or they've got too many other commitments with, you know, like, I'm not bad in summertime. I'm like, no, we're going to the beach and we're doing car shit. You know, I'm not, there's no kid sports, you know, winter times when you play sports, but people just have other agreed. Other yeah, I yeah. agree with you a hundred percent. Let's put yeah. that in legislation. Actually, yeah. no cricket, none of that shit. You know, I'll I'll say that to, yeah. <laughs> I say that to these two kids. Don't even think about summer sports. No, they're off. No, they're off. No, they're off I, I, yeah, we live near the beach. And as far as I'm concerned, yeah, that's, the, and that's what I did as a kid. I played soccer during winter and then summertime. Hey, it's holidays. You know, what do you want to play sport all year for? Um, but, um, you know, like motivation is a tricky one because, you know, it was too much about the burnouts for a while and, um, you know, that, but you still, you still need that element of stupidity and mm. craziness, but yep. then you've also got to keep it safe, you know. And, and there's, you know, for a while there was too many cars to the point where they'd get all the cars out to cruise and it was gridlock, you know. So, yep. And then you limit the number of cruising and people complain, oh, I've got to wait too long to cruise. So it's, it's finding that right balance. I think the, the number of cars they have, you know, if, if they, I think they had eight or 900, you know, in the early days, but then you'd have like, you know, 13 blue Subaru WRXs or whatever. So then they, they got a bit militant about what they let in, you know. Hang on. Oops. Oops. Wogs talking uh-huh. with their hands. Um, yeah, they, they got a bit militant with, with what, you know, they, they'd let in. And so people complained about that. So, mm. Um, you need to keep that that uh, the cruising happening, and people love to see the cars, you know, skidding and and smashing tires and stuff. But um, you know, you still need to make it family friendly. You know, you've got to be able to take your kids down there. You don't want people, you know, getting too drunk and stupid, and you don't want anyone to get hurt. I mean, I've been at yeah. a couple of summer nets where you know, like there was a, a car drifting on the trotting track, and it, you know, at, at fairly low speed, it went into the crowd, kind of looped around drifting and I'm like oh shit that's it no more summon that's but they got through that but you just can't you know you can't risk anything like that and everyone bangs on about safety but um mm. I think and and the motorplex is such an amazing venue as well you got to you know if you've never been to summon that's it's a dust bowl you know they just yep. the council doesn't care about the joint there like you camber itself that they, they they don't water the lawn you know ever and so it's there's no grass that's growing you know the every car is filthy there when you go to motivation and, and eastern state has noticed that when they come to the motorplex wow you know what's this green stuff and oh look there's no dust on the cars you know it's it's great yeah. you get all you get is like 
tired us from all the burnouts. <laughs> that's, mm, that's all yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Those little black um, particles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think that you know they're kind of doing the right thing. You know, where you know you can cruise a fair bit, and you know people can get a little bit silly if they want to. But mm. you know, people just need to be sensible about sensible about it. And um, yeah, you know, I think uh, it's it's good what they're doing. They do like a Friday night for the entrance only. I think that's a really good thing. But you know doing it over three days it's just you know all the people that work there are volunteers a lot of people need to understand that and um you know quite often by sunday half the cars have been blown up and you know there's they, they mm. leave the burnouts till the very end on friday and then hardly you know well most people would hang around and watch it for a lot of the big Easter staters are there but yeah you know it's a big ask to have three days worth of, of stuff like that but um mm. i reckon if they do friday for the entrance and just have a really big saturday that goes into the night um you know it's uh that's that's enough for me. I I rarely yeah. would go for two whole days anyway. But mm. you know, guys want to go and you know they've got drums of methanol and eighteen sets of tires. They want to get rid of them. They don't want to go home with them. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, anyway, I mean, we'll, we'll watch this space. It'll be interesting yeah. to see what form motivation looks like in, in yeah. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, like I said, people just need to, to get behind it. I mean, it's, mm. a, it's a good event and it's, it's still, I, I don't know how they can, they need to work out what to do with the elite tent. And yeah. people either need to, you know, go in there, um, you know, and say it's it's going to be elite and it's going to stay in the tent for two days, or they, you know, whether they just do the elite on one day, then let the cars cruise. I don't know. It really depends what mm. the owners want to do. And then the the judging needs to be, you know, spot on because you know, to be honest, sometimes the judging at motivation has been a little bit, uh, you know, imaginative. I, I don't know. You know, some people um, shake their heads at that as well. So I know I know yeah. that's a, a bit of a bit of a problem that they need to address. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Well, Boris, look. I mean, before we finish up. One of the other passions I've noticed, model cars. Tell us a bit about that because you, you've got a number of. I looked, I went through your website, and not, there was quite a quite a a reasonable collection of, yeah, of model cars yeah. that you've built yourself. Tell us a bit about that. Well, you know, when I was going through year eleven and twelve at Balcatta Senior High School, instead of doing homework, I'd build model cars. You know, so I'd, I'd smash them. Out. I, would, I would do like one every two nights. You know. Yeah. Um, and they, but they didn't cost like 50 bucks or 60 bucks at the time either. Mm. No, I oh know they, they're just great. You know, my, my very first model car kit was a 1940 Ford pickup. I don't know why I chose it. It's about the most difficult model kit to build, a uh, monogram kit. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I used to get them for presents and stuff, you know, as a, as a young kid. And you just put mm. them together and they're great because you learn, oh, that's the cylinder block. Because it would say, you know, engine block or cylinder heads and transmission. So you, you got to know all the major mm. components of the car yep. just by putting a model kit together, you know? So, um, yeah. And, and that's something even my kids don't, you know, I've, I've started to build a couple of models with them, but it's, uh, it's kind of hard when you've got young kids and older kids and you've got leaving sharp knives and glue and paint around it's, it's a recipe for disaster, but now they're all a bit older. I'll, I'll yeah. Into it a bit more. But, um, you know, just there's actually a club called Perth and Districts Model Club, and I was involved with them. And to be honest, that's how I really got into the magazine game because I became the editor of the of that magazine. It was called okay. Model Mania. We had a club magazine, so I used to put that together. Um, you know, back in the in the mid to late nineties. So I've got a few of them kicking around somewhere. So that uh, that was good fun. So um, yeah, because I I had a, a computer and and one of the guys in the club worked at Snap Printing, so we get the printing done cheap. And uh, I used to put together a, a really good like every two months a really good club magazine that was wow. like a mini. It, it was all features. It was model cars as well as they did military stuff. And yeah, some guys did airplanes and tanks and whatever. Mm. You know. So that was uh, my first foray into into editing a magazine. But um, uh. And like I said, it's just a great way you can build all those cars that are in your head without having to actually go get a loan from the bank. You know, you can try different colors, different, you know, styles and you know, all my stuff's mostly, you know, hot rods and 50s and 60s style mm. stuff. I really love that kind of um, 60s, uh, late 50s, early 60s kind of uh, aesthetic, you know, um, Bellflower style customs and just mild customs that, uh, you know, are, I, I modified just enough to make them look a bit better, but not, not crazy, you know, some, yeah. of, um, you know, some of that kind of stuff. And, and I just love all my early hot rods and, you know, um, 20s and 30s Fords that are built to like a 50s or 60s style, you know, and that's, that's my next car. But I've been saying that since I've been about 20 something years old, <laughs> I want to build a hot rod, but uh, you know, <laughs> life does get in the way. And, and uh, yeah, I, I cop a bit of grief over that, but uh, the, the passion still burns deep and it'll, it'll, it'll come, you know, yeah. um, I'm just, just having fun, you know, keeping my car going and, and, uh, the, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, a, it's, 
it's a 12 second car that I drive every day. So that's pretty good for an old four door rambler. You know, so. That's pretty stout. 12 seconds is stout, especially for a daily drive. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. That, that is yep, stout. So that, that's pretty good. That's really yep. good. Yep. Hi, Boris. Well, look, we'll, um, we'll wind it up here. Like, so just give us that website again, www.rumbler. Yeah, the, the hyphen the rumbler. So T-H-E right. hyphen rumbler.com. It's still, it's still there. And if you put a forward slash WordPress, I've got like a, a more modern version of it, but all the classic old stuff's on the original uh, rumbler site. But um, yeah, there's, there's stuff from a whole bunch of uh, car shows dating back to about 1998, 1999 mm. and some, uh, some of the early hot rod shows and then a whole bunch of stuff, um, you know, when I lived over in Sydney as well. Um, yeah, okay. You know, Victorian Hot Rod Show, Geelong yep. Nationals in 2003. So it's nice to go back and it's like a bit of a... Oops, I really got to stop talking with my hands. Um, <laughs> we can't, we can't it's, help it's like, Boris. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's how we yeah, are. But it, yeah, but it's a bit of a historical record of stuff. It's kind of yeah. good to go through and go, oh, that's when so-and-so had his car painted that colour or, mm. you know, those wheels on it or whatever. So yep. like, quite often... You know, uh, especially now with a digital camera, I'll just even though I've got photos of the cars already, I'll take another photo because they do mm. just change over time. So it's uh, yeah, yep. Now, well, if you if you're watching the video, it's on. I've got the website at the bottom of the screen right now, so you can see that there. And um, make sure you head on over there and um, check out some of Boris's content. You can also check out his content at Street Machine. Get a Street Machine magazine yep. from it's. Pretty much, I, I don't. I've never been in news agents where they don't have a street machine. So yeah. it's, it's 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 everywhere. Yeah. It's distribution's very good. Yeah. So yeah, and yeah. you can you can also there's a uh, online store. So you get a magshop.com.au and mm-hmm. you can actually purchase a street machine hot rod there individually. And I think um, you can't buy the street machine magazines individually, but you can get subscriptions um, through there. So uh, yeah, but yeah, support support print. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep us in the job. <laughs> I get the mine every month. Has, you know, yeah, yeah, the coronavirus has um, you know, put a bit of dampener on things, obviously events and stuff like that. All of the freelance guys like myself and Jordan and that we've basically been put on hold for a bit. So hopefully we'll get through it all and hmm. the magazine will be going uh, strong as ever um, in, the, in the next month or two. So now, well, yeah, sadly, Victoria is not looking so good at the moment, but I think there's hmm. a few events coming up in Perth. So we might have to... Um, try and sneak a bit of West Aussie content uh, in the magazine, I think. Yeah, most certainly. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, even more so than that message is, um, I can't, uh, yeah, um, stipulate that message any clearer. Yeah, get behind Street Machine Magazine, go out, buy a copy. I buy one every month. I've got, actually, I haven't bought the one with the green AP, AP5 on the front, but I have got the XB. I get to go through that version with the XB on the front, that, yeah. that edition. Yeah. So... Get your Street Machine magazine um, and subscribe as well. That's that's the best yeah. way to do it. That way you don't have to be like me and go into the news agents once a month. Yeah, so. Some, yeah just if you're if you are in Perth, sometimes the mag- the mailman comes about a week after <laughs> the magazine goes on sale. Yeah. So not always, but it does happen. But don't uh, don't panic. It'll uh, it'll get there. And if you ever have a problem, you just send the guys an email and they'll. I'll sort it out. They'll, they'll send you an issue or something like that if it doesn't come. But uh, yeah, just support us, please. You know, like I said, we're, we're all genuine car guys, you know, from you know, Andrew Broadley, the editor, he's a Tirana driver, but he's a top bloke, you know, right down to all the, all the contributors, all the photographers, all the journos, you know, we all love our modified cars. We're passionate about the scene and we, we love to you know, put it on paper. So it's mm. No, definitely. Definitely. Hey, Boris, look, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure and it's great to have someone that's from the, A, from the hood, but B, <laughs> also from the industry, especially in WA. I've never spoken to anyone that doesn't know you. So <laughs> um, that's, it's really, um, it's quite an honor to have you on. And I, I'm glad we caught up at, at Motivation and we were able yeah. to spend a bit of time chatting and, and to get you on here tonight. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's been great. And we'll get you yeah. back on again, uh, no doubt in the future. We'll, we'll get you on where I am trying to organize like a kind of an open forum where we yeah. discuss we're going to discuss a few people in the industry. We'll have you on for that as well. So yeah. we'll be discussing uh, a few things. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And like you said, a lot of people know me, but um, you know, I'm, I'm really all about just promoting the, the, the scene in Western Australia and getting as many West Aussie cars as we can in the magazine. So, but don't nah, just no ring worries. me, don't ring me every day with your, you know, your cars trying to get in a street machine. But, um, <laughs> but we, we're definitely looking for feature cars all the time, you know? Um, so, no, nah, yeah, definitely. It's good, definitely. good to get the local stuff in the magazine. Yep. yep. All right. Good. Okay, Boris. Thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. See ya. See you, Tom. Okay.
Ah, bien, fair, oui. <rire> Okay, episode 89 of the Talking Power podcast. And I'm, yeah, that was a, a good, good trip down memory lane, wasn't it, Todd? I actually quite enjoyed that. Yeah, I was actually blown away. I've met Boris once or twice around the traps, but never realised how far he went back. And yeah, I just was blown away, to tell you the truth. Great so guy. Thanks, Boris. Yeah, yeah. No, great. And thank you. Thank you for joining us, Boris. We really appreciate that. Okay, look, we need to get stuck into we need to get stuck into Formula One. The Formula One kicked off again this weekend, Todd, and um, I don't know what to cover first or how to, to discuss <laughs> it. But I, I I think we can talk about the Formula One till the cows come home. I'm going to kick off with Formula Three, and yes, thank you, thank you, Mark. Thanks. Write this name down. If you're listening to us right now, stop yep. the car, pull over on the side of the road. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. If you're watching this video right now, get a pen and paper or get your phone out, whatever you're doing. I'm going to give you a moment to do that and write this name down. <laughs> you're right. Everyone's right. Oscar Piastri. Oscar Piastri debuted Formula 3, first race of the year, debut race, takes the win. What an absolutely magnificent result for Oscar. And I can't tell you how proud we are as, as Australian. This guy, this kid, he's only 19 years of age from Melbourne. Um, he actually got into a stoush at the first corner. Did you see that, Todd? No, I missed that bit. I sort of watched a little bit of it. And then I went, hang on, who's this guy? And we did a bit of homework and I missed it all. So, yeah. No, no, I've been following Oscar since last year. I've been following him. His name come up uh, somewhere else, and I followed him last year. But this is his debut year in Formula 3. He did Formula Renault last year and did extremely well in Formula Renault. He's, he's come out in the first race. This is no word of a lie. He, and he has won the first race of the year. Now, he did come eighth in the second race. He didn't qualify as good on the Sunday. But, look, I mean, this is an emerging talent. So... Yeah. Like I said, if you haven't written it down, I've got his name up on the screen. Oscar Piastri from Melbourne, 19 years of age. So, Todd, you watch the Formula One at all? I watched a little bit of it. And I must admit, I ended up sort of watching the replay earlier this morning before I went to work. Yep. And I gave up and went to work. You missed probably one of the best races in, in many years, actually. I, I, um, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. But I must say, it's the most unusual TV I've had. The, uh, uh, the, the viewing, not the race, but pre-race, so qualifying Saturday night and then post-race, the, it, it's just making for some intriguing television at the moment. And look what's happening in the world at the moment with COVID-19 and the, the sort of... Um, <laughs> steps we're taking to protect yeah. ourselves is really flowing through in other parts of the world more so than ours in Western Australia. And it was quite um, confronting. That's not confronting, but it's a, it's a, it's the stark reality of this, this, um, yeah. this pandemic was really evident at the formula one. And um, from what I understand, Austria is not that, is quite safe there but i think every single person you know had a surgical mask on or a face shield as well we saw toto yeah. wolf do all his interviews with a face shield and all the drivers i think sebastian took his surgical mask off after qualifying um he had plenty of time because he didn't even make it to q3 he um <laughs> got bombed out in q2 but that's another story but it made for some interesting tv one of the things i don't want to get political on the podcast it's not our place to 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 do so but one question i have for mainstream media is i don't understand how they took away from the race um more of the story was on the drivers that didn't take a knee at the start of the race so yeah that i read a bit about today actually if if that's what we took from the race yeah from a media perspective well i don't think you should be reporting on on the sport at all. Those yeah. drivers all said they weren't taking the knee days yeah. before the event. 
why are we focusing on that? There was one of the greatest, there was, I won't say the greatest race, but we had safety cars coming out um, at really convenient times. Not so much for uh, Valtteri and for Lewis, but yeah. they were those guys were really running away with the race. But um, it, the pack got squeezed up again, and we saw some of the best racing we've seen all year. It's not the first race of the year, I might, might add. But I mean, the, fir- the some of the best <laughs> racing we've seen in the last twelve months. I'll put it that way. I, I, I thought it was absolutely amazing. The Albon and Lewis Hamilton incident again, really. I've got to be honest, it was really, to me, a racing incident. I couldn't say that was Lewis, Lewis's fault. Lewis didn't go out to, to hit him. And I don't think he was able to turn in enough to give Albon the space. That said, Albon was past him. So at the end of the day, I think the stewards, yeah, it was a tough one. I really thought it was a racing incident, but I can understand yeah. why they gave him the five-second penalty. What I can't understand, what I don't understand is how on earth Mercedes didn't allow Valtteri or didn't allow, yeah, told Valtteri to pull over and let Lewis through because the five second penalty was issued with, I don't know, there was still a few laps remaining in the race. So Valtteri should have pulled over, let Lewis go ahead and keep, let let him build a lead on the cars Mm. behind him because as it turned out, Lando Norris turned the fastest lap of the race on the last lap and was able to nap third spot and kick Lewis off the podium. Surely, <laughs> surely someone in Mercedes could have identified that Lewis should have been given the lead and build, have clean, because he had a clean track in front of him. The safety car was out not that long, not that much beforehand. So he had a clean track in front of him, turn the engine up. They, the engines were turned way down on the Mercedes, turn the engine up, let him hit a few curbs and get, get a, get a reasonable, not a five-second lead over Valtteri. That wouldn't be fair. Valtteri yeah. would have to run with him. But keep that keep that gap between the two of them. But give yourself a five-second lead over third place. But Lando yeah. turned the fastest lap of the race on the last lap and relegated Lewis off the podium. So I don't, I don't quite understand that. I don't think... It's not really in the spirit of the sport, I agree. But yeah. I didn't think it wasn't a good look for, for Mercedes, especially when the CEO was sitting there watching. Yeah, I mean, while we're on that topic as well, like about how they should have wound the car up, now, how many cars finished? Uh, there were, can't remember, but I think there was nine cars out. So, yeah. no, not, yeah. Yeah. The, the, Which, for the first round back, yeah. I was a little bit surprised at that number, you know. I thought, you've had six months to sit around. Why are you so many out? But anyway, that's... Renault, Renault, the ones that really I can forgive um, Alpha Turi. They had the puncher. Yeah. I can forgive a number of... I, I can forgive Haas, brake failure. Yeah. But I can't forgive Renault anymore. This is not funny anymore. This is... You've, you've had your... You've had your basically time to remedy these cars and we're still yep. seeing continual problems. I, I was wrong about da, uh, Daniel's move to, to Renault. Um, uh, last year I was willing to say that they're still building on something. No. I don't think they're building on anything except it a pile be, of crap. I don't want to jinx Daniel being a Perth boy. It could be a career killer for him. If he doesn't get out there quick smart. He's in well, he's off, he's off to McLaren next year. Well, he's already right, signed still... McLaren. Yep. Yeah, well, no, no, he's. I mean, he's 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 off to McLaren, and I think you know we're seeing McLaren come good right when we wanted him to. Yeah. So yeah, I think he's moved to McLaren's timed well, but I am very disappointed with his time at Renault because, like I said, you know I could pull out probably ten episodes last year when I was arguing with yourself and Simon saying you got to give it more time, just give it more time. Yep. They're going to come good. They're Renault, you know. Oh, I'm just, I've given up on that now. That, that was that was pitiful. Both cars out yeah. uh, last night. I, I can, like I said, even Max Verstappen's um, Red Bull, Honda. Yeah. I can understand that. They've got the runs on the board. 
uh, it slipped into what they call anti-stall. I don't know if that's true or if that's BS. They're just feeding us BS. But the car slipped into anti-stall and that was the end of his race. That said, Alex had an absolutely magnificent race and he was coming hard at Lewis. And I mean, he got around Lewis on the outside. That said, the, the Mercedes were turned down and there was some issue that they were reporting on that um, that they couldn't hit the curbs that hard. So I really don't yeah. know. Anyway, I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I, it's um, it's an interesting season. All right, we're going to take a break here, and we'll be back right after this. Episode eighty nine of the Talking Power Podcast. You're here with Todd Brinkworth, and I'm Nick DeChambry. Bringing this podcast to a close, we've gone well over on this one here. This will be a, a quite a long podcast, so if you're still listening, um, um, you've done very well. I'm not going to pull out all the prizes again, but subscribe to our website. <laughs> Head to our website and subscribe there. Just put your email address in and your name. You can Man, I see, I, where, just where do you one find part that? of it. <laughs> this is a donation from the lovely Nicole Travellini. Um, and all fast so, race cars. I wouldn't mind that, but anyway. <laughs> well, you're in the running, Todd. Anyone that's good, that subscribed well, is in I the running. I can't win. We know that. So. No, no, yeah, but you shouldn't really. But anyway, we are. And yeah. also, by the way, we are going to draw that next week. Next week, out of and out, off, off week, I'm going to do a yeah. special podcast live, and we're going to draw the winner of all that stuff. I'm not going to pull it out again. Just look like a giant size idiot. All right. Now, shout outs. We've been full of shout outs tonight. Yeah. Um, Brendan Franklin, hashtag because race car, head to his head to his Instagram page, head to his YouTube yep. channel, head to his Facebook page or whatever, head there. He's a great guy. We interviewed him on stories from the garage a couple of months ago now. And he is doing a lot of media work down at the track. And he is responsible. He's the I don't know what you call his job title in um, media, media guy for the radio, WA radio, red versus blue. Yeah. So he's working there with Corey Marriott. So I head to his, any of his social media. He does an absolute magnificent job and he's releasing a video. I shouldn't say this of someone we know quite well. Oh, okay. Mm, radio <laughs> car, white Falcon. Oh, anyway, all right. Coming out oh. soon. That's good, good video. Oh, I got to see. Should cut more out of that, but anyway. Nah, it's all right. By the time yeah. it goes there, I reckon it'll be out. Oh, fair Sorry, enough. Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, also head to Andy Kale's, um Therapy on Wheels. The website's on the bottom of the page right now as we speak. Head there and get that book. Don't wait for the green light. Don't wait. Don't wait, Todd. And on a serious note, um, you take a bit of a serious. I just want to. Um, Condolences to um, Gerald McNornan. Gerald hosts a f- Facebook live show called the Motorsport Show. Gerald's wife, only 43 years of age, suddenly passed away uh, just recently. So they've taken a bit of a break, Gerald, from the Motorsport Show. Um, we're in the same space, I guess. I don't know Gerald at all, but I know he shares very similar interests to us. Drag racer or drag racing, you know, is probably his core following, but he also does the supercars. He does everything. And, um, yeah, we pass on our condolences to him and his family at this time. And we sincerely hope we see, I'm sure we will see, return of the motorsports show with his um, offsider Phil as well. We hope to see them back really soon. But, um, yeah, our thoughts are with you at the moment, Gerald. Um, and also we need to just shout out to Adam Ward, Dan Ward and Car Talk, Matty J and Adrian as well. So you will see that as a, there was a quiz based on movie cars in movies, so, yeah. which I thought I might've been better at, but I wasn't, I was pretty ordinary. You and me both. I, uh, I had a chat off air with another, uh, well, follower and colleague from the podcast gone by, uh, Turkish hmm. and, I think I'm going to get a sucker on the head almost. He said, you should know bloody better. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> okay, David. 
Thanks, yeah. David. Thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for your. Yeah, no, no. He meant it nicely. Don't worry about that. Oh, <laughs> sure, he did. Yeah. <laughs> hey. We are we are right out of time. This has gone yeah. well over, but that's always good. Don't let that's um, we're talking about cars, so it's all good. Yeah. Um, so we'll be back again in a couple of weeks' time. We're going to big announcement to make in two weeks' time. Big announcement. Our next podcast episode ninety. Make sure you tune in because we've got a big announcement to make at that podcast. And between now and then, we will draw this prize. This prize pool. There will be a lucky email subscriber winning all of that winning yeah. all of that and i still don't know where the other stuff is but there's two of these as well <laughs> okay yeah. so there's, well, i showed one before there's actually two of them but i just don't know where it's gone right now <laughs> all right todd any anything closing from you no i think um just bear in the back of your mind targa southwest yes the, uh, eighth, one day eighth is the 8th of august yep um i will be down there Yep. Uh, I still don't know in what capacity, <laughs> but please come say hello. Um, Nick might even be down there. Not sure. Yeah, oh, look, I mean, my plan is to be there. So yes. Yeah. Um, but we'll be down there, and we'll be hopefully doing something live and dangerous, so so to speak. And it, it'll be good to get out again. Let's put it that way. Our um, our last event we were technically out for was the Tiger Sprint Series at Panana. And the whole world went into lockdown about two days after we did that. So it was literally good to actually, two days after, yeah. Yeah. It would be good to actually be back at Targa with um, Dave Smith, Ross Tapper and the boys. Um, and the ladies, of course, down there. And we'll see what we can bring to you down there. But looking forward to it. It'll be cold and wet, but we're looking forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward uh, to it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, look, my plan is to be there. So um, you just got to work out what we're doing. Yeah. So... All right. Well, on that note, we'll call this one. We'll bring this one to an end, and uh, we'll catch you in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks for joining us, Todd. No worries. Thanks, Nick. All right. Take care. Talk and Power, your motorsport and motoring radio show. Now on eighty-eight point five FM, the Valley comes alive, and podcasting across iTunes and talkandpower.com.au. dot